To open up those cramped apartments, ambient video number three, the lobby camera. I know what you're thinking, that movie critics are supposed to travel in pairs, at least here on the tube. So you are doubtless wondering, hey, where's the fat one? Well, this isn't the mundane world of television with all its moral and aesthetic compromises. This is the wonderful world of video with a whole new set of moral and aesthetic compromises. Just think of me as two film critics in one. And now on with the shows, a big load of movies that just made it to tape and are dying to be reviewed. Six hundred dollars, say, he break all six. Imagine, Orson Welles never dreamed of doing a sequel to Citizen Kane, but here we have The Karate Kid, part two. Does the adventure continue? Well, no, it just sort of persists, like the flu. Portly and crusty Pat Morita is back as the wise old teacher, and squeaky clean Ralph Macchio is back as his dull young pupil in a follow-up that begins with a brawl mere moments after the first film ends, then jumps forward six months to Okinawa, where our lads return to settle an old score. But slowly, very slowly. They get involved with the Japanese godfather and his surly toughs, but nothing much happens until the kid begrudgingly agrees to enter an ice-smashing contest at the local Mixushi. And if you think that's exciting, well, you might consider medication. Karate Kid Part 2 is very good exercise for your fast-forward button. But if you loved the first film, you'll probably at least like this one. Alan Alda pokes gentle fun, would he poke any other kind, at Hollywood in his mild comedy, Sweet Liberty. A vulgar film director declares the only three things young people want to see in movies are defiance of authority, destruction of property, and taking people's clothes off. Sweet Liberty could use more of all three, unless the clothes to be taken off are Alan Alda's. Al wrote, directed, and stars as a grinny history teacher whose book about the American Revolution has been cannibalized by those filming it. Alda is in too many scenes. He obviously slept with the director, and Michael Caine, as a boozily womanizing movie star who borrows a helicopter for a short joyride, is in too few. It isn't terrible, but it is talky and self-indulgent, and Alda, of course, has cast himself as yet another pillar of integrity, or maybe just a pill. Toxic Avenger has been on the midnight movie circuit for months, and midnight seems just the hour for it. A very funny, vicious comedy about a literal slime ball of a superhero, Toxic Avenger is truly sophomoric and proud of it. And when you think about it, there are some darn funny sophomores in the world. In this gruesome romp, a mop boy at an athletic club falls headfirst into a barrel of toxic waste while wearing a pink tutu. He emerges a living, breathing, oozing monster who sets about cleaning up the corrupt town of Tromaville, toxic waste dumping capital of the world. The violence is outlandishly explicit. Eyes are gouged out, noses bobbed off, arms pulled from sockets, and heads squished. But all for a good cause, giving the audience cheap thrill. One of the funnier sequences isn't a gross-out, just a montage of dopey deeds by the heroic, hideous fiend. 
You'll enjoy Toxic Avenger most if you agree with the following statement. Crude trash is preferable to slick junk. The storm, there's a storm coming. So? The lab. They've got a security system there. TV cameras, motion detectors, all kinds of stuff. Only the thing is, it's all electric. So? Lightning, lightning, don't you get it? No. We can get in there. Critics dumped all over the Manhattan Project when it played theaters. They just didn't think it was cute that a 16-year-old boy steals a glob of plutonium and proceeds to build himself a working nuclear bomb. He wants to win the big science fair in New York. Marshall Brickman, who used to work with Woody Allen, directed this variation on war games in which we all learn a lesson about mutually assured destruction. Guess what? Not a good idea. One highlight, Christopher Collet as Paul swipes the plutonium from an evil arms manufacturer called Metatomics, using, among other things, two Frisbees and a remote-controlled toy truck. The finished bomb is lifted from the boy's car by Mary Pranksters, but he gets it back and with girlfriend Cynthia Nixon makes a getaway in a cab pausing to deliver to the driver what is arguably the film's best line. Hey, mister, I bet you can't guess what I got in this box. The film isn't boring, but it's not satisfying either, in part because the inevitable moral is too obvious, in part because the two young heroes seem like a pair of snots. I wonder why they gave us these tags. So they know who we are if something happens. Now, speaking of bombs, as in the bomb, one of the most deadly serious films out this month is Desert Bloom. But unfortunately, it's less serious than it is deadly. It's all about a very nuclear family living around Las Vegas in 1950 and 51 and preparing with great dread for the atomic age, which for them means mushroom clouds from nuclear testing almost in the backyard, the ultimate barbecue. John Voight slobbers around as a worthless drunk. Joe Beth Williams plays his preposterously forbearing wife. Ellen Barkin is her sister. And newcomer Annabeth Gish is their painfully sensitive 13-year-old daughter, who's no match for Peggy Ann Garner in A Tree Grows in Brooklyn or Sandra Locke in The Heart is a Lonely Hunter. The movie obviously hopes to give you an emotional workout. But about the most it can hope for is that you'll hate it so much that you yank it out of the VCR and chuck it across the room. Don't worry, the store may not want it back anyway. You know, I think I may disagree with myself on that last one. I may have missed some of the subtle shadings and nuances, but then I can take that up with myself later. Elsewhere on the video horizon, which stretches almost as far as the eye can see, there is something for every taste, or if not for every taste, at least two, bad and good. Invaders from Mars is Toby Hooper's attempt to redo and overdo the 1953 sci-fi fantasy about the little boy who sees Martians landing in the field behind his home and then watches in panic as the whole town gets sucked in, literally, to the Martians' underground base. The new version isn't great, but it has special effects by John Dykstra more elaborate than those in the original. And while much of the casting is depressingly wrong, Louise Fletcher gets right into the spirit of things as a teacher whose brain is taken over by the invaders. Late in the movie, the obligatory scientist who tries to reason with the monsters scene is very well handled by that mercurial scamp, Bud Court. You see, they do understand me. In the 1950 comedy, A Woman of Distinction, an editor asks who would be interested in a romance between an astronomy professor and a college dean. The filmmakers should have asked themselves that question. This is a pretty pale period comedy, but Ray Milland as the professor and Rosalind Russell as the dean do brighten it up to a shine. See it before some ghoul colorizes it. Ginger and Fred is right at home on television. Because television is one of the absurdities of modern life, it attacks. Federico Fellini reunited his two great stars, his wife, Giulietta Messina, and his screen alter ego, Marcello Mastroianni, for this satirical fable about aging vaudevillians reunited on a deliriously gaudy television show. The long buildup is too slow and gabby, but the show itself, the last third of the film, is pretty sensational.
three of producer-director Otto Preminger's films are out on tape. Advise and Consent is a very watchable 1962 Washington melodrama about the highs and lows of movers and shakers. Charles Lawton is magnificent as a mountainous southern senator. The Cardinal, made in 1963, is a lengthy religious epic starring Tom Tryon, later a pulp novelist, as a Roman Catholic priest who manages to be wherever the most momentous events of the 20th century are happening. It's broad and bland, but it's still much better than the average network miniseries, if not much shorter. St. Joan was Otto Preminger's calamitous attempt to film the Bernard Shaw play in 1957, with a young unknown plucked from obscurity in the lead. The star was Jean Seberg, and she never quite recovered from being burned at Otto's stake. Stephen King, the human mint, turned director, sort of, for Maximum Overdrive, a cheerfully stupid horror picture in which a rogue comet passing over the Earth sets the world's machines running amok. Essentially, it's Night of the Living Trucks. Emilio Estevez is the young hero, though he doesn't look too sure about that, and King has a cameo early in the film as a man insulted in no uncertain terms by an automated teller machine. Lots of trucks blow up, and many members of the cast achieve maximum overact. You can! We made you! Thank Your Lucky Stars is the best of the all-star wartime picker-uppers. Most of the big guns on the Warner Brothers lot were drafted into the service of a vapid little plot interrupted for terrific musical numbers. It's insignificant as a movie and sensational as an entertainment. <laughs> And there you have this month's supply of movies on tape. If you called it an embarrassment of riches, you'd be half right. No, there's plenty among the new releases, either genuinely worthwhile or intriguingly dreadful. And that's what the movies are all about. And I am about all out of time. So remember the words of a wise old man. If you can't say something nice about somebody, think about becoming a critic. Rocky, Rambo, all American heroes. Now Cobra joins the home video hits. <laughs> Stallone is a cop called Cobra, the strong arm of the law. Now available on VHS and Beta video cassettes only from Warner Home Video.